think that any of us could have stood this power of Bob is giving out like the man they can. You have to, it's like being an athlete, you know, if you're not trained for anything, you, you have to train gradually over a long period of time to take the, the, the punishment, you see, the, the uh, to take the gap, really. You couldn't take Baba unless you'd been trained for it. And I think the man really had to be trained for this, to have lived with him the way they did. Because ordinary people like us couldn't have. So, you know, you should only take so much of this high, high, high tension. Because uh, I know uh, at the center, I said once to, I was sitting with Margaret and Kitty. <clears throat> I said, I don't know why, I'm so tired. I'm just drained. And why am I so tired? Kitty said, don't you know? You know why. I said, why? You have things done as usual. And she said, she says, Baba, you know, he uses up your energy. And he transforms it. It's like a dynamo, you know. He transforms. He gives it back to you. But while this is going on, you're kind of worn out, you know. I lost... In 56, I lost about 10 pounds just for those three weeks I was with Baba. I went back to New York, everybody thought I was a skeleton. I had only no meat left on me, you know. Um, so you can imagine how people have lived with Baba for a long time and what they have to take. You were the power station when you were with Baba. Now let's see where we're back in 58, right? Um, now, I can tell you a couple of things. This came up a few times in meetings, so I thought I'd tell you about them. There were interesting orders that Bobby gave direct orders in 1958, in June 1958, after he went back to Myrtle Beach. He said, for 40 days, beginning in July 14th, 1958, repeat audibly, but softly, 1,500 times daily at one sitting. If necessary, it may be done in two sittings. We had to repeat, Beloved God, thy will has come to pass, and all that our Baba has declared will soon have come to pass this year. 1,500 times. But the Bundy Night group had to do it 5,000 times, and I was included in that for some reason. The dancers got away with it, but I didn't. I had to do it 5,000 times. Maybe it was the past sins, I don't know. We had to give up one cherished item. I gave up coffee, because that was my love at that time. He says, do not let this appear with your livelihood. So you had to keep on working just the same. What time is it? I didn't know what time we started here. Uh, it, it was me talking then. Uh, he says, I may send one special instruction in October. He says, do not write to India re regarding the above order. Then in September 14th, yes, on September 14, 1958, he said to me, he wrote me a letter and he said, this is the special instruction that I said I might send you in October. And this was the instruction he sent me. On each of the following five nights of October, the 1st, the 7th, the 14th, the 21st, and the 28th, repeat for one hour from 12 p.m. to 1 a.m. Quote, Beloved God, thou art the soul of all souls. Unquote. Father from seclusion. He was in seclusion at that time, and that was the special instruction I got. I had to acknowledge immediately to I uh, already received this. Then we had orders not to communicate with Barbara at all, unless in an emergency. Well, up to this time, I had been given permission. Well, everybody had been given permission to to uh, send him birthday greetings, and I think uh, Christmas greetings. I think it was Christmas greetings too. And uh, I also had the, a, a chance, uh, for some reason, I don't know how it worked out, but I had written to Barbara about Valentine's Day and explaining what val Valentine's Day meant, and I sent him a Valentine. And then after that, I had permission also to send him a Valentine every Valentine's Day. So, so I'm asking, how come you get a chance to send a Valentine's Day? <laughs> and the rest of us didn't, you know? <laughs> I don't know how it came about, but it came about, you know? <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, <clears throat> I took Baba literally, which he said, you're supposed to do. If he said, you're not supposed to communicate, you don't communicate. So his birthday rolled around, and I didn't send him a birthday greeting. Uh, so this is what uh, happened. Monty wrote me on uh, March 3rd, 1962, quote, missed your name on a birth of birthday wishes. In other words, a whole group of people had sent him wishes at the bedside, their names, and I hadn't. 
And Baba said, where's Billy's name, you know? And then he had, and she said, well, she's not on here. And then he said, well, did I send her, him a separate one? She said, no. She had to, I had to tell him you didn't send a separate one. So uh, I thought, well, that's funny. He said, don't communicate except in an emergency. Well, I obeyed him, right? So I went to Margaret. I said, well, maybe you can play, figure this, Margaret, figure this out. I said, why does he, why do I get such a letter as this when I'm obeying him? You know, Margaret says, thought for a while, and she's so clever, you know. She, she said, say this. And this is what I wrote. <laughs> Quote, she said, say, thought direct messages forbidden except emergency. That was a cable. Didn't think birthday emergency. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's Margaret. I'm not that clever. <laughs> Didn't think birthday emergency. But love not diminished. Then I added myself, happy birthday to my Valentine. <laughs> I never got a reply to that. I wouldn't have said uh, <clears throat> What time did I start this? Yeah, Twelve? Well, listen, when you get a little tired, let me know, because we'll stop then, because I don't want to bend your ears too long. I have to get out of here at three anyway, don't I? What time do I have to leave, three? Okay. <clears throat> um, then, uh, where we live a lot of things in and out, so I won't go into all the details, but 1962 came in the east-west of Havas, and uh, we all went. And uh, while I was there, uh, Baba had a big pandal erected outside of the Maharani Baroda's palace, uh, where we all sat. And one day, while we were sitting there, it was a beautiful, bright, sunny day, not a cloud in the sky, Baba made some reference to rain. And uh, he about five minutes passed, and the rain came down in a cl cloudburst from nowhere. I mean, I don't know how it could have come so fast. It was so it came down so heavily that the panda was of no use. We were drenched. Nobody budged. My hair was stuck to our faces. Our clothes were soaking wet. It was running off our fingertips. Our feet were encased in mud, that yellow mud they have there, you know. And then it stopped just as suddenly. And... Uh, the uh, women mandolin made an archway. The, the women were always, we didn't see the women except on a special occasion there, but, the, but they didn't come out onto the platform or anything, or under the pandal. The women mandolin were in the back, in, in, in the, in the uh, Guru Prasad. And uh, they uh, formed this, they came out and formed an archway, and Baba told certain of the Western women to go in, under the archway, into the Mahabharani's palace which was right back of Baba's, where Baba's seat was. <clears throat> and we all trooped in to the back. And there we had to take off all our clothes and give them to the women mandalay, and they took care of them. And we had to dress in the, in the clothes of the uh, women <coughs> mandalay. And I had a, I don't know, I got a cotton dress, which was miles too big for me. It, it, the neck came down here, you know. It was, I don't know, it was hung down. It was a big, I don't know what it looked like. I mean, and... Um, it was, uh, we looked funny. We had to go back to our hotels like that, you know, all this new rig we had on. But the women mandalay were very sweet. They uh, they uh, took all our clothes and washed them and dried them and sent them back to hotels to us. Just as sweet as can be. And, you know, do all that work for us. But I thought that was a significant, uh, well, why do we have to go into an archway and into the back and change clothes? Very interesting. Um, uh, there was an interesting time, the last day with Baba, uh, was, uh, was another interesting, uh, strange thing happened. The, you know how it is in the East, and the crowds are there, you can walk on their heads, and Baba was in his car, and the people were jammed all around. You could couldn't move. For some reason, well, I don't know what happened to the Westerners, they all disappeared. They must have been there somewhere, but I didn't see them. They were all Indians around me. And here I was, 
I couldn't even lift my arms. It was so close together, packed, and they were so tight. The sort of crowd was sort of swaying. It was a little scary at first, you know. We were sort of helpless in this mob of people, you know, and they were all swaying, trying to get close to the car. And Baba's car couldn't move. There were so many people around. I couldn't budge. And then I began to enjoy it in a way because it was like walking in a volcano, you know, with lava flowing back and forth. And uh, quite suddenly. A pathway opened up right from me, right to Baba's car, the drrr, like that. It was so sudden as if, like the party of the Red Sea, I guess. It was just like that. And uh, it was so sudden that uh, an old woman with a white sari, remember, she had white hair and a white sari, and she fell to the ground, I guess, by the sudden opening up of the pathway. She fell, and I went to help her, and somebody pushed me from the back, and another man grabbed her and picked her up, pushed her back and said, go. I don't know who said go. And I ran up the path, and Baba had, was sitting in the front seat, and he had his arm resting on the, uh, on the back. And just as I got to the car, I reached out and I touched Baba's hands, and our fingertips touched like that. And then the car, for some reason, the car took up speed, and away it went. And that was the last I saw of Baba. And the dancers, he had called the dancers in because at that time I didn't know I was still didn't know I was with the dancers as you remember I told you last night and uh, the dancers had uh, been with him and he had told them that they wouldn't see ever see him again and he, I, so I didn't know I wouldn't see him again I didn't know until he dropped his body actually so I don't think I could have gone back if I had known you know that he he, he was would be the last time as it was, you know, I just had a good time, you know, having, having to touch him again. And, uh, however, since I didn't consider myself as one of the group, and Baba was seeing groups that day, I said, I don't know how, I wanted to see Baba have a message from somebody, and uh, I have to give them the message. Also, I had a fascination with Baba's feet. And I had been writing to Mera about Baba's feet, and she said, haven't they viewed you should kiss, kiss his feet someday? I said, yes, I'd like to. But, you know, I can't, being a Westerner, you don't go around kissing people's feet. It's embarrassing, you know. So I thought, I'd just love to kiss his feet. But, you know, I'd, she said, why didn't you take the chance when you saw him 58? I said, well, there's too many people around. She said, well, next time you should take the opportunity. So I thought, well, if I can get to see him this time, I will do it. Besides giving him the message. <coughs> So I, I said, well, I don't know how I'm going to get in. I said to one group head, and he said, well, if you don't go in with the group, you, with us, you're not going to go in and see Bob at all. So I didn't take that. And the dancers, why don't you come in with us? So I said, well, I'm not one of the dancers group. So uh, finally I said to Mani, I said, uh, how can I get in to see Bob? I said, because I'm not with a group. And she said, well, <coughs> I'll see what I can do. So she went in. To Baba, I don't know where she talked to Baba or what she did, but she came out later and she said, Baba will see you alone. So I went in to see Baba and I had a chance. First I kissed his, his left <coughs> toe, then I, I don't know what came over me. I, I used to be called Baba's cat and I think that's the reason I was, I was called his cat, but I have a savage breast or something, but I bit his right toe. <laughs> Not hard, but I bit him. He looks at me, you know. <laughs> but it was so tempting, you know. <laughs> Never take it. But he didn't say anything. He, he took it quite well. I gave him the message. I, I gave him the message, and uh, then I, I left. So that was my 1962 hot sahabas. Poor baby's crying. <laughs> Well, now we get to the parts where uh, this is after Baba, not after Baba's body, but after I had seen Baba for the last time. Um, I used to send jokes to Baba and things to make like that he would enjoy hearing or having the band read out to him and so forth, and articles or whatever were right things. And uh, one day I saw an article by Malcolm Muggeridge in the Ladies' Home Journal. It was dated June 1967, and it was entitled, Is There a God? 
I thought this is very interesting about what Malcolm Muggeridge says about is there a God and his speculations. So I thought Baba might be interested in this, so I, I cut it out and I sent it to him. But Baba wasn't reading any mail, he wasn't, he was strictly in communication. He was getting more and more withdrawn. And um, I got a letter back saying that one day Baba came out of his seclusion briefly and asked Erich to read him something. And Erich picked up this article by Malcolm Muggeridge and read it to him. And then Baba had Erich write to me, or was it Monty? Somebody had write to me anyway. And told me that I should settle, uh, send Malcolm Muggeridge a copy of God Speaks, The Everything and the Nothing, and Stay with God. Not as from Baba, but as from me, leaving Baba out of it. Well, I did this. I wrapped up these books, and I sent them, and I wrote Malcolm Muggeridge a note, and I said, you know, you don't, don't take this, that uh, I expect you to pay me for them or anything. I just want you to read them. I thought you might be interested. After I had read your article, I thought you might find these books interesting. That's all. And I sent them to him. And, um, and I said, Barbara Cable, and I said, mission accomplished, unquote, period. And that was that. Then I thought to myself, well, what was that all about? You know, it had to have somebody, because nothing that Baba does has no meaning. Everything he did, did has some meaning. Well, I, uh, about two years later, now mind you, this is two years later, that was in, I read it in, in the Divyavani. It was dated ni- uh, September 11, 1968. It was an article by Delia Delon. Uh, and she said in that, in order to attract more people to Baba, they had invited Dr. Alan Cohen to come and give a talk <coughs> to the English group. And uh, he arrived on September 11, 1968, she said. On that day, the BBC called Delia to have Dr. Cohen appear on Sunday on a TV religious program, Why?, hosted by Michael Muggeridge. (laughs) Through this, Baba's name was mentioned, she said, for the first time on TV in England. Delia stated, quote, We cannot really yet see full the repercussions or results of his visit, but that it was fruitful there is no doubt, for Baba was with him all the way. And, of course, the group began to grow then, and, and quite a resurgence and in interest in Baba happened. But you see how Baba protects you, your ego from getting big. He, Baba had done all the work. Malcolm Muggeridge had run the thing. Alan Cohen had to go over there. The group had to invite him. And I had a very, most no part to play at all. I didn't even know I was doing it. So you see, you, you have no, he doesn't give you a chance to say, go look, see what I've done. But you didn't do anything, you see. So you don't have a chance to build up your ego, just trying to show you how he creates the situation. But it took me two years to find this out. So you see, there are a lot of other questions that came up, and I'm trying to find what happened and what happened, why this and why that. I always get an answer sooner or later. I always do. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of uh, odds and ends here. Uh, I don't think we have time to go into them. Um, uh, maybe I have time to give you one more thing. I've re- I told some of you this, and it, it concerns Tim knows of this, because when we went to India in 1979, I hadn't been to the center and didn't go back to the center until 1971, because I couldn't bear to see the place after Baba dropped his body. I didn't want to have any part of it. I'd never been there except when Baba was there, and I didn't want to be reminded. I didn't go to India till 1979 because I couldn't bear to face the fact that I wouldn't see him there when I got there. So finally I gained the courage to go in 1979. And I went with Tim. On the way there, I was what Tim wanted to read on the plane. And I kept beating up my gums, telling him, well, I don't see why people keep saying Jai Baba all the time. When we saw Baba, we all said, Hi, Baba. I mean, he was, that was good. So why do we, now do we have to say Jai Baba, you know? And I was saying, And why do the people keep giving me prasad from India? Baba was the only one that they gave me prasad. Why, why should I take, prasad means a gift from God. Why are these people giving me prasad? 
you know. I don't need to have Chris Prasad from anybody but Baba. And then I was saying, I was criticizing further, I was saying, and all these ceremonies, people having ceremonies all the time, I didn't leave the church to come back to ceremonies. <laughs> My connections with Baba, not to get involved with ceremonies all the time, they don't mean anything. They're just, just facade all the time. So I put him one to read, and I kept, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Well, when I got to India, when I had been in India in 62, Arti was simply singing Baba's Aarti and, and uh, waving a, a tray of camphor, uh, lighted camphor, in front of Baba and singing the Aarti. That was Aarti in India then. So when I was told that they were going to do Aarti at, in Baba's tomb in 79, I figured, well, that's what's going to be the same. So I went to this ceremony and I stood outside the tomb and I had this heavy bag that I have now. Not this bag, but one this is bad. Big heavy bag and it was full of passports and money and this and that and the other. And Prabhu said, "Be careful! Don't be careful of your bag. Be careful of your passport. You know, it gets stolen." So I was always hanging on to this big heavy bag. And I was standing in the doorway of the tomb. I figured I'm going to watch this arti ceremony that the, the women mandali were on the tomb and they were going to do it. I'm standing outside watching this, and uh, all of a sudden, Mary says, "Come in." So I had no idea I was going to have anything to do with this ceremony. I was just observer. So I had to go in. I went in the tomb and I was standing there, just inside the doorway. And uh, then Ma uh, Mara says, come up to the side where she was, just opposite where Mara was, actually over the crypt, on the other side of the crypt. So I'm looking for, what am I going to do with this bag? If I leave it here, it's going to, going to fall over it. I had no place to put it. Suddenly, one of the mandalay grabs it off my shoulder and throws it to the corner. <laughs> I'm seeing this uh, passport and memory all in the corner, you know. But what can I do? So I, I go up to the side of the crypt and I, I, you know, I'm all thumbs by that time. I don't know what to do. I don't know. I don't understand Mary's gestures. What she wants me to do? Apparently, she wanted me to help her lay this blanket of flowers over the tomb. But I finally get the idea and I help lay the blanket. And then I'm to go around the other side. I feel so darn clumsy, I don't know how to get over to the other side. You know, it was just, I just felt just all thumbs. I couldn't keep my mind on anything holy or, ceremon or any ceremony or what I was doing. All I could think of how clumsy I was. To get to the other side, then I had to help spray the perfume and go in the picture and all that. Then after we did all that, then she said, go back where I was before. So I went back where I was before and I grabbed my bag and I put my shawl figure I'm finished, I can go out now. But no, I had to stay there. Then the women, uh, Mandalay, each bowed down, you know what they do, they put their head to the floor and they lay a flower and so on, one after another. And well, I watched that. And all of a sudden, Monty says, it's my turn. Now, I have to tell you here that years ago I had a boyfriend and we were very much in love and uh, all the loves and uh, uh, we had a, a song that we called Our Song. I suppose many of you have had the experience of having this is our song, you know. Well, Begin the Begin was our song. But when I met Baba, it got transferred to Baba. Begin the Begin was Baba's song, but it was mine too, so it was mine and Baba's, you see. So there was a special reason for this, what happened. And uh, so when Mani gestured to me to come and, and bow down in my turn, I was just going to do it. Now this is interesting because you see the timing how this happened. It was too neat to be just a coincidence. Just as I'm going to do it, the little boy about this high runs into the tomb from outside somewhere. He runs in, he bows down and leaves a flower, you know. And he gets finished. And then Mani says, now go. I'm going to do it and another little boy runs in. And he bows down and, and leaves a flower. So I'm standing there, and then uh, just then the one of the man even takes up my bag and flings it in the corner again. And Mani says, so, all right, so I finally, the minute my head touched the floor, the uh, guitars outside start playing begin the beginning. Exact same moment, that moment. It was as if Bob had said, see, I've been doing this whole thing. I'm the one that did it. And as he was making fun of me, you know, and my prejudices and my, about ceremonies and saying, you're being so silly, you know. Why, and, you know, after all, if other people want ceremonies, why shouldn't they have them? If it makes them feel good, why should I criticize? 
you know. And then that wasn't the end. I grabbed up my bag after and finally stepped out of the tomb. I no sooner got outside than somebody hands me a big bag of prasad. <laughs> and, you know, is this a coincidence? I don't know. They give me this big bag of prasad and fly off. I haven't got time. And they go, well, I don't know where they went, and there was nobody I could give it to. And they all start filing out of the tomb, and I have to hand them this prasad. <laughs> well, Baba said, you know, you're not supposed to make a scene and make other people feel uncomfortable. You have to, you know, <coughs> try to do the right thing. So I couldn't just say, I'm not going to do it. So I started giving out prasad, as Baba did. He gave us one each, you know. And everybody would take one. And I thought, gee, you know, of all things, not even handing out prasad myself now, but I'm giving it to the manly of all presumptuous things, giving it to the manly. Who am I to give it to the manly? And I was saying, I can only have it from God. You see? Now I have to give it to the manly. See? And I'm doing it, and one, by, one fellow comes by, and he goes like this, and he goes, shakes his head, but looks at my pie, and I thought, what's the matter with him? You know? Then another girl comes on, she says, you're supposed to give two. <laughs> well, I thought to myself, well, I always got one from Baba, but if they want two, let them have two. So I said, two. Yeah. So that was my lesson. You see? Well, I think maybe it's 25 after 1. I think maybe we can have questions and answers, don't you think? Sounds good. Do you have any questions? Did you go to the 69 Darshan? No, I, I didn't go since 1962 till 79. I wouldn't go to India. When Baba dropped his body, I considered that a cancellation. You see, we had been told we were going to go to India in 54, 55, I think it was. And we were all set to go, and Baba cancelled it. And that sort of, we all, the dancers all felt the same way, you know, we, we felt that that was sort of training us for what was coming, because we felt that dropping his body was a cancellation. So uh, had he been alive, I would have gone. But once he had dropped his body, I felt, well, that's the end of that, you know. <coughs> it's just... Just too much. What was the timing on the you sending the books to Malcolm Muggeridge? The timing? I mean, you know, in relation to Alan Cohen being on his on his show. Well, I sent them. They, he, Malcolm Muggeridge got them just before. Just he must, yeah, and he had written me. He wrote me back and said he would read the books, mm -hmm. and I sent his letter on to Baba. Mm -hmm. Yes, he got them before Malcolm Muggeridge was invited. So this reason for everything you do, if you wait long enough, you find out, you know. The thing that Baba does has some meaning. You see, it isn't one thing. People expect you to, how do you know he's God, they say. Well, it isn't because he raises the dead or something like that, or heals the blind or the sick or something. It's what all these little things that they build up, ordinary common every day that you wouldn't recognize until you look back and you see what happens and you know. Of course, being with him is something else. There's no question. Even ignorant as I was when I first met him and, uh, and um, didn't know who he was. It took six months, but eventually it did hit me, you know, who he was. But not everybody is, is, is for Baba. You know, some people go to Baba and Baba would Send them off to another religion or something. Depends on how prepared you are. You know, what you need to live out. Some people have come to Baba, and then they've gone away for a while, lived out a portion of their karma, whatever they had to do, and then have come back. So a lot is your karma, too. You know, that energy that you were talking about, Baba was giving out while you were hiding? The yes. For those people who ended up not getting attached to him, was he not sending it out to them, or were they not just receiving? Or did well, it generalize it like I don't know. I mean, but none of us know because he didn't let us in on his secrets, you know. But uh, if you can call them secrets, but uh, I feel that in some cases he just veiled himself, so they just didn't get it. I had that feeling when that boy met him that I was interested in. You know, he just he just sort of shut down. He could do that. See, also, Baba 
although he made everybody that was with him feel that they were all getting his undivided attention all the time, and that was hundreds of people at the same time without speaking, he could also make certain people feel that he was ignoring them. He did that to one girl in 62. She felt he was ignoring her. But he did that for other reasons. You know, that's not necessary to send them away, but to rouse probably some sleeping sun scars or whatever it was. He, he was different every time. In 1952, he met me and he just got the two of us, knocked us off our feet. In 1956, it was my honeymoon. That's when he was softening me up, getting me all, blah, 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 so that, you know, I could face what was coming. I didn't know what was coming. He knew. I had the strength to do what I had to do in 58. And 58 was different when I met him again. I was full of guilt. Although I, the love was there, I was full of this, mm, this terrible guilt. And, uh, and then in 62, in India, he was more God. With us, he was very, very intimate. He was with me. I, I know, I can only speak for myself. I can't say that, you know, everybody has their own story. But with me, it was the most, in, what she said, ours is the most intimate of relationships. There should be no shadow between us. It was the most intimate relationship you can possibly have. It's your own self within you. And he knows everything about you. There's nobody more intimate to you, with you than Baba. And that's what he was with the Westerners. At least most of them agree with me that that's how he was. So different than he was with the Indians, you see. With the Indians, he was God. They have this, you know, the Indians that come here have this very reverent attitude about Baba. We used to say, hi, Baba. We were just pals, you know. We were different. He treated us differently. from the. And when we went to India, he was different than he was with us here. Then he began to lower the boom on us. Then he was more God. He was more remote. But the love was still there, you see. But it was more remote. He was God in India. But he's everything, you know. I mean, he's intimate and he's God and he's human and he's... I, you know, I don't see how people can have love. I mean, it's amazing how somebody can love God impersonal. I don't know how they can love an impersonal God. I could never do it. The, the personal God is what I needed. How can you love someone you haven't met and you don't know? That's how I feel. But a lot of you people have do love him and haven't met him in this life, but you may have met him in another life. So you carry it over. So it's uh, very interesting. Do we have any more questions? Everybody's, in the beginning, everybody had so many questions, and now nobody questions. Everybody's so small. How old were you when you first um, heard about that? Hmm? How old were you? you How old was I? Yeah. Well, I'm 70 now. Oh, really? I thought you were older. Huh? No. no. <laughs> and this was 1952 when I met him. About 40%. I was 39. 39. I just, um, I wonder how you feel about those first 39 years. Um, how do I feel about the first 39? Well, you know, Mayor Baba was here, and you weren't conscious of the fact that he was oh, here. Oh, I, I wish the heck I had met him then, but I, then I wasn't ready. Is that why you think that? I think that, you know, I had to live out what I had to live out. I had to... I had to find out the uselessness, the ephemeral nature of the world and everything in it before I met him. Nothing lasts. Nothing. Even we don't last. So what, uh, what does all the fuss about, you know? So I was ready for Baba. I had to lose my mother, my father, my home, my husband, my health, my career, everything. Everything was taken away from me, so I was ready to meet Baba. If I hadn't had everything swept away, I may not have been, because uh, I, had, I had very strong family ties, you see. So he swept everything away. He did the same thing to Margaret Krask. He killed her mother, her father, her, her, uh, her, uh, her boyfriend. He took her, her, her job away. He, uh, she, she sprained her Achilles tendon. Her career, everything was gone. <clears throat> she was on her office when she met him. <clears throat> just like I was. So if you don't 
live out what you have to live out, you're not ready. If you've got yens in this direction, how are you going to go in this direction? But I wish I had been ready. It would have been nice, wouldn't it? If I could meet him when I'd been young. And yeah. <laughs> you made reference earlier to a um, I thought you made reference to a story. There was, um, you know, there's an interesting story that happened in uh, 1974 <clears throat> that uh, Bob is still building scaffolding. You know, I'm not the sort of person that will go into a restaurant or any public place and make friends with people I don't know. <clears throat> I have to be introduced to people, get to know them. I don't, I don't, I'm not raw, I'm <laughs> not like that, I'm not that outgoing. <clears throat> I wish I were, but I'm not, you know. And uh, I used to go to a health food shop in New York and uh, eat at a counter there for lunch. And um, I, uh, I met some people there, you know, and I made friends with them, which was unusual. I never do that. <clears throat> and uh, I made friends not only with the people that used to eat there, but with the, the man who used to make up the you know, sandwiches and all the other stuff behind the counter. And we all became friends. And then we began to go out in the evenings. We had dinner together. It was a very nice group, about nine or ten people. A very nice group. And uh, we enjoyed it. But that's just this went on for about a year. And in the group was a girl, her name was Mairead. And uh, one night after we went, had dinner, it was in May, and it was a lovely night, and we took a walk after dinner. And somehow, rather, she and I were separated from the others. We were walking in twos and threes. And I just started talking, I don't know how we get onto the subject, I never know how I get onto the subject, because I never, I don't go around proselytizing, I don't go around talking about Baba. I only talk about Baba if people make the right kind of noises, you know. Uh-huh. If they make the right kind of noises, then I'll tell them. Because, you know, you can't just go around yakking about it with everybody, not everybody's for it. So, I, I, I don't know how we, we just started talking, we got into Baba. And I started telling her about my moving Baba and this, that, and the other, and she became interested. Before I knew it, she was really, really into Baba. And one night, she and I, and the group as usual, were having dinner in this other health food restaurant, and a friend of the man that used to be behind the counter uh, in that uh, health food shop, he, uh, he came in uh, with a friend, and he joined us at dinner, and he introduced us as George. And, uh, it was a week before I was to give a talk at Mir Baba House when it was down in the village. And uh, I don't know how that came up, but it came up somehow. I didn't realize this had happened at the time. I found out about it later, like I usually do. And uh, he, uh, when I talked the next week, apparently he came down, I don't remember, but he came down to Mir Baba House and uh, listened to the talk. But right after this, the group split up. And I tried very hard, it was a nice group, I tried very hard to keep them together, but somehow what kept the group together was no longer there. It just dissolved. The only one that stayed was Mairead. George would, you know, was, didn't come that close to fame, though he, did, he, he still calls me from time to time. But next thing I know, he went down to the center. Then next thing I know, he was in India. And now he's a follower of Baba, though he doesn't belong to a group. He's a loner. Mairead is a follower of Baba today. And she, I didn't know this. I found it about, about this, I found out about this only this winter. We were discussing, you know, these things, and she said, uh, you know, do you know, realize, Billy, she said, uh, I have never made friends with people in a public place before. We were talking about our meeting that group. I said, neither have I. And she said, that's interesting, isn't it? She said, I have never done that. And I said, gee, that's strange, isn't it? And I began thinking, we began talking about it, and we realized that this was another situation, the scaffolding that Baba had built up. And that was dissolved. After my raid and George, the contact was made, the thing disappeared. And this is only in the 70s that it happened, you see. So apparently the process is still going on. I say apparently, because who knows? Bobby didn't give me in, let me in on any uh, secrets. He didn't tell me what was going on. He keeps doing his work. Yeah, you met my raid. You know my raid. So she was sent with us several times, right?
But it was Lou Reed that made me realize that. I didn't even realize that it happened, actually. I just took it for granted that she was interested and George was interested. In fact, I didn't even know that George... I said, how did you get to know Bobby? He said, through you. I said, how did that happen? He said, well, didn't you remember you, you talked to Bobby about the house? I found out about it at dinner when you were in, uh, came with Philip to dinner. When you were at dinner together at that restaurant. And then I went down to dinner. That's how I found out. I didn't know that. See, how do we know? We just don't know what's going on. I don't know. I don't know what he was doing because I never did. You see, I made it a policy never to ask Father advice about anything because I didn't know what I was going to hear and I didn't want to hear it. So I never asked Father for advice about anything. The only time I asked to see him was the time I had to give that message and I wanted to kiss his feet on the time when uh, when I wanted to confess I had misled him on the signs at the center. But I, I, I never stuck my neck out. I'm very... I'm very much of a politician in that respect. Uh, you know, I don't. Put, I never put myself into. I heard too many stories, but other people said, "Bob, you know, can I do this or that?" And then, you know, they got themselves in all hot water. So I said, "Uh-uh." <laughs> the father tells me, "Okay," but I'm not going to ask for trouble. You know, so I never asked for trouble with father. I got soon enough without. <laughs> you know. You can't fool around with a master, you know, unless you get burnt. You're very careful. I guess behind that, I was thinking, Bob always said, don't worry, you know, don't mind your life forgive you. He said that quite a few times. And some people have that personal experience where that worry or that feeling of guilt just completely left them, where they felt that it had to be Baba's grace to feel, to actually feel forgiven. Well, when he said, you, you know, I forgive you all for everything up to this day, I felt better about that, but I had to forgive myself. I wasn't willing to forgive myself. I still wish I could have been perfect. But, you know, none of us are. Even the madly are not perfect. I had a letter from Monty which made me feel very good because every I've never been able to keep a silence day without saying a four-letter word. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my favorite word, incidentally. I wish I could stop it, but I can't. Anyway, uh, I... Uh, I know that the, I, I'm trying to open a can or do something and I can't, nothing will work and then I let it out, you know. Well, Marty wrote me a letter saying that she was talking about one sound day. She said that uh, she was uh, with a bird on the branch somewhere near that on silent day. And it was tweeting. So she, she, she tweet, tweeted back at it. She went, you know that, and then she realized she wasn't. She had broken the silence. And on that same day, Mara, the, the great one, you know, there was she was talking to the dog. <laughs> <laughs> and they confessed it to Baba later, and Baba laughed. And took it, didn't think it was anything important, you know. So I mean, you know, if they, they do something unconsciously, I lie went deliberately, you know, which is too big for me. But see, the main thing is, and I've come to realize, the main thing is you have to love Baba. It's love. If you love him, okay, you'll, you'll suffer, yeah, you'll suffer. You cause your own karma, you have to suffer for it. I mean, he's not going to change his laws just to please you. I mean, the whole world would go upside down. You can't do it. But, he's not going to change his love for you. He loves you just the same, no matter what you do, and somehow he'll pull you out of it sooner or later, if you continue loving him. The only thing he asks from you is to try. I mean, that, he's not asking you to be Superman overnight. Just try. Love him and try. And if you, what can you do? Uh, long ago, I came to the conclusion that you can't love him because you want to love him. You can't do anything. We're not, we're not powerful enough to do anything about him. In fact, we do nothing ourselves. The only thing you can do is think of him. You can do that. Everybody can do that. I mean, if you're crippled and my watch, if you're, you can, you can do that. You can think of him, and if you think of him, you're creating a link. If you create a link, he works through the link. But you have to, he's, he's God, and he's a God that gives you your own will. He's not going to bind you. You have freedom, this Baba, absolute freedom. Any master or anybody that curtails your freedom, forget it. They're not true. They're not the real thing. Baba, in every way, left us free. 
You are free, really free with God, and I could nothing else. He lets you free, and if he curtailed you in any way, you see, you wouldn't be God, right? So, you have the choice, then, of thinking of him. If you do that, that's your will, not his. And then he does the best. Because when you think of him, that genders the link. The link engenders love. And the love makes it easier for you. And then your will and his will become one after a while. But you have to do your part by thinking of him. And that's all you can do. What else can you do? We're full of some scars. We don't know what's behind us. You know, all that love I had from Bob, I still wasn't able to obey him utterly and completely. And not all people weren't either, as I found out. They fell by the wayside, too. But if you long as you love him, just think of him. You can do that. Make it your business to think of him as much as you possibly can. Try to bring him into your lives. He said to me, take me with you, I am within. Make him part of your life. He doesn't change you on the outside. I mean, if you have, if you have a lousy temper like I do, and I still have a lousy temper, the father whittles you from within. He works like a termite from within, you know? <laughs> and to all empty inside. And then when the last day comes, this awful person which you still remain on the outside, he flicks it and it crumbles. You see? But you have to want it. You have to be the one to decide. In the end, you are the one that decides, not Baba. Isn't that nice? I mean, who else leaves you so free? This is why I have, I, I, I'm very much against group heads that try to tell you what to do. Who are they to tell you what to do? You know, no one has the right to tell you what to do. Only Baba. And you get that from Baba by thinking of him all the time, as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just been a really delightful couple of days we've been able to spend with you. And just yeah, okay. feel like you've really brought Baba, these experiences with Baba to all of us. Well, that's all any of us can do, is just tell you what it was like, you know? Nobody can do more than that. And uh, nobody can tell you what to do. You can only choose for yourself. Ugh. So we just time to get the airport still. So. Well, last time. Yeah. Before folks leave, let me just say quickly that Ralph has offered to show some of the uh, things that he brought back from India, um, which he has for sale, and they're all up in I think Dave's room. Oh, wonderful. Upstairs. So, okay. you, you know, please. Yeah, that's the only thing I ironing board set up. He's got it all upstairs. Oh, good. So, yeah. take advantage of that. That's for things. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Bob. Okay, Bob. Okay, Bob. Okay, Bob. Okay, Bob. Okay, Bob.